everybody. I'm Edward Sabin, and my guest is uh, Lisa Holm, who is uh, in the box next to me. You can tell the difference between us. It's quite obvious. Um, just a little bit about kind of me and, and the class. I mean, April told you, uh, Anita told you a bit about it, but um, so I spent about 20 years in media. Um, before that, I went to UCLA. I'm a double UCLA graduate. I did UCLA undergrad. I studied English literature, which uh, I wasn't entirely sure what to do with. And so uh, inertia took me to UCLA law school. Uh, and I became a lawyer and would, became a partner at a law firm in Los Angeles. And then I decided that I wanted to uh, do something that some more exercise the creative and business side of my brain. So I left UCLA, uh, i sorry, I left my law firm and I went to uh, Fox where I ran uh, business affairs, which is what you call what lawyers do in studios. And then my job morphed from business affairs into more like um, operations of the studio, kind of more business management of the studio. From then I went to uh, Discovery Communications, which is Discovery Channel, TLC, Animal Planet, Science, Oprah Winfrey Network, um, now HGTV, uh, Food, and many, many, many others. I was the COO of Discovery Channel and TLC, the two biggest uh, networks in the portfolio. And from there, I went to um, A&E where I ran the international business. And I am now uh, running a production company that I recently launched called Cypher Content. And part of what I wanted to do in kind of the phase of my life where I wasn't in a corporate world was share my experiences and what I've learned uh, in the, uh, uh, the television business over the last uh, X number of years, you know, 20 years in the business. Um, because I found that in media companies, it's surprising how much people know about their particular jobs, but they don't really understand the full ecosystem of the television business. And, you know, what is a studio? What's a network? How does each of them make money? What's a streamer? How do streamers interact with talent differently than uh, studios do or than traditional networks do, et cetera? Um, you know, how does the advertising business work? Like there's some basic bedrock knowledge that if students had, they would be much better prepared to have a successful career in, uh, in television. So I'm super excited to share those insights with people who have an interest in the media world. Uh, the name of the course is uh, uh, Extreme Disruption, how, digital, how the digital boom is busting legacy TV. And so it'll talk about the foundations of the bedrock of, of business, but then also how, you know, Netflix, Hulu, Prime, HBO Max, and all that stuff is kind of like throwing all this stuff into disorder. And where are the chips kind of landing? And one of the speakers who I have invited to participate in the course when it happens over the summer is Lisa Holm, uh, because she is one of the people who is responsible for a lot of the disruption that, uh, that, that legacy, well, sorry, I'm here to tell the truth. Um, that uh, the legacy uh, businesses have encountered. When I first met her, I had to be very nice and polite because she worked at Hulu and was in charge of acquisitions. And I had to please beg her to buy the shows that I was selling from uh, A&D International, uh, which she didn't. Uh, uh, but I never didn't hold that against her. I, she's still a dear friend and somebody who has had a spectacular and really interesting career. And I think somebody who can help um, uh, you know, gives shed some light to all of you guys. And so right now, uh, her, she's working at Discovery uh, and has been responsible for the development and the rollout of the Discovery Plus service, which is the direct to consumer um, presence of Discovery in the marketplace. But before that, she worked at Hulu and she has actually a very interesting career path, which Lisa, welcome. I probably would ask you to start telling us about your meteoric ascent from cradle to mountaintop. Uh, Edward, well, thank you for having me and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I think you hit the highlights, um, but uh, maybe for, for this group relevant to start at the very beginning, which is uh, out of undergrad, um, started as a, a management consultant. So did the sort of, you know, co professional equivalent, I guess, uh, to an MBA uh, out of undergrad, having been a psych major who spent all of her time doing theater. Um, so it was quite a rude awakening to be staring at spreadsheets and PowerPoint all day. Um, but incredible training, uh, which I would highly recommend to anybody as sort of first job out of undergrad. Um, 
really did that to sort of get some amount of business training because I thought I wanted to maybe be a producer or a studio exec at, at some point. This was before streaming had really happened, uh, largely before even a lot of kind of digital uh, content had happened. Um, did, did my stint in consulting, uh, then thought, okay, Hollywood, here I come. Uh, did the classic uh, first job in Hollywood, someone's assistant, uh, was answering phones and scheduling meetings um, and uh, worked at a company called Illumination Entertainment, um, which at the time was a teeny tiny startup, uh, six person company, uh, grew to be the company that has released all of the Despicable Me movies and Minions, Lorax, um, has been a sort of a grand success in the feature animation business. Um, but was, you know, kind of just a, a scrappy startup when I joined. Um, so spent a few years there learning the film production business um, and sort of how major studios worked. Figured out um, after a few years there that that was not a part of the industry that looked like it was growing uh, in a sort of meteoric, uh, healthy kind of way. And based on how early I was in my career, it's probably time to strap my wagon to something that was going to be a little higher growth. Um, where my own kind of growth within it, within the industry didn't depend on someone above me sort of getting fired, um, but that there was organic growth sort of built in. Um, so I started looking around um, at digital. This was um, 2010. Um, so when digital was still called new media um, in a lot of cases um, and I uh, joined Hulu when it was also pretty kind of scrappy early stage, I joined right as Hulu was launching the uh, subscription service that had been free ad supported, then became a subscription service, uh, then known as Hulu Plus, um, and uh, was there from kind of zero subscribers up to about 30 million um, when uh, looking after content strategy, content acquisition, international acquisitions, co-productions, um, spent my last year or so there developing plans for international expansion, um, which is now not happening uh, under the guise of Hulu, but Star, uh, which is sort of the general entertainment, non-kids and family brand uh, of Disney is launching next week uh, on top of Disney Plus. So a little bit of the uh, sort of uh, end of that end of that story uh, next week, um, but joined Discovery just over a year ago um, to help Discovery launch its streaming product, Discovery Plus. So looking after um, content and commercial partnerships for Discovery Plus. And um, it's been quite a ride, uh, but we launched um, about six weeks ago and uh, very excited to see its progress so far. So Discovery Plus is like the latest, it may not even be the latest uh, D2C, a direct-to-consumer service launch. There are <laughs> so many direct-to-consumer apps. It used to be, oh, Netflix, Hulu, oh, Prime. Now like everybody's you know, brother-in-law has a, uh, a service just generally speaking, like what, how do you see the future unrolling of more and more of these? Is there, is how much is too much? Is there room for more? Where is the next one coming from? Like what's the general path of the industry? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of um, folks have kind of made the analogy of the evolution of cable where it started, there were three or four big broadcast networks. There were kind of something for everyone. And then cable networks sprung up that were more focused on a specific audience or a specific type of content. I think that al analogy stretches to a point in streaming uh, where there were sort of the initial big three-ish services that were kind of broad, little something, you know, of every, some, a little bit of something for everyone um, across every different content type. Um, and now some of the services, Disney more focused on kids and family, Discovery Plus more focused on unscripted. Uh, they've always been kind of more focused, uh, audience targeted uh, SVOD services for a long time, like uh, Crunchyroll on anime, um, you know, BET Plus, and Acorn for British drama. Yeah, but okay, um, let me just interrupt you because Discovery is more focused, but it's Discovery and it's TLC and it's Animal Planet and it's own and it's HGTV <clears throat> and it's DIY and, and food and so many others that I'm forgetting. So it's not, it's still a mass market player. Like, is there room for a crunchy rub? Like if somebody were to come to you and say, oh, I think that there's a great service for young moms. Do you say like, you know, what are you smoking? Get over yourself. Or do you say like, oh, you know, that might work if it's well executed, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I think it's a question of um, sort of put a few things together. So um, what is the size of the audience that you're trying to address and how uh, sort of how unmet are that audience's needs by other things that are out there? 
And then what is the cost it's going to take to capture that opportunity in the form of content or marketing technology investments? Um, and I think uh, you will see in the next few years, the um, sort of Piper come calling on where those two things really start to crash into each other, where um, the, the expectation I think of consumers of a streaming service is to have a gigantic volume uh, very high quality content with new getting at it all the time. That's the kind of expectations that's been set by a lot of these bigger, broader services. Um, where the difference of you know seven dollars, twelve dollars is not a huge difference in terms of pricing. Um, and so when you go kind of more niche, are you you know how little is little that you can charge? One of the the trends that we see happening, consumers sort of demanded for many many years the aspiration for unbundling. The don't make me pay for eighty channels. I only watch six of them. Please let me pick and choose what I want. Um, what we've gotten with a lot of these uh, services starting their own streaming services is closer to that a la carte pick and choose what you want. Turns out that's actually not a great consumer experience because now instead of having all of the content in the world in a single cable bundle where you sort of knew where to go and you, you know, knew where to find it and everybody kind of had the same choices about what to watch. Now there's this extraordinary plethora and explosion of different streaming services. It's really annoying for the consumer to keep track of which is, which services that show on that I want to watch and why do I have all these different, you know, bills and every time I want to watch something, I have to open up a different app. It's very sort of annoying. Um, and so we're starting to see even the beginning of the trend towards rebundling um, the unbundle. Where? Who's doing um, that? I know it's been talked about, but like, where is that actually happening? It's happening among the device platforms. So uh, the kind of Apple, Roku, Amazons of the world where you can buy from Amazon, you can buy Amazon Prime, you can buy uh, Showtime, you can buy CBS, All Access, you can buy Acorn, you can buy a lot of different services from Amazon, single bill, Amazon ingests a bunch of that content. So single app, you can just go to one place and kind of all that content is there, depending on which services you've subscribed okay, to. Okay, but so hold on a second now. So your discovery, you're expecting, you know, what is it, five ninety nine a month or something like that? Okay. Six ninety nine and four ninety nine, yeah. Okay, we'll get to the packages in a second. But like, are you then, again, without revealing anything particular about your business that you can't reveal, are those channel services, um, those packagers, right? Discovery Plus is packaging their stuff. Do they say to Amazon, okay, I expect it to be $6.99, $5.99, whatever, but if you sell me in a bundle, you can cut a deal? Or if, as, am I, as a consumer, buying it in a bundle, but I'm just paying the same as I would have paid for every individual one and you're just bundling them? Yeah, I mean, the answer is there's both, all of the flavors are kind of out there and being developed and experimented with. So, um, You've seen uh, Discovery Plus bundled with Verizon as a wireless carrier, where depending on what tier of Verizon wireless you have, you can get either six or 12 months of Discovery Plus bundled in with your cable, or sorry, with your wireless uh, subscription. And then after six or 12 months, you start paying the $6.99. Um, Disney a year ago did a very similar structure with Verizon, which started as you know one year bundled with your Verizon bill and then you eventually you start paying for Disney, but partway through last year, presumably they renegotiated, I don't know, but they started offering a new offer, which is that at certain tiers of Verizon, it was actually bundled forever. There is never a moment at which you have to start paying extra for, uh, for Disney Plus in certain plans. Um, so you see lots of that kind of thing. You see lots of um, Hulu did a Spotify bundle where there were a couple different flavors, some where it was Hulu and Spotify, single price forever, um, you're always only paying one bill for those two services and have also done a, you know, buy two, get a slight discount on, on the combination. So mm -hmm. you're seeing all kinds of different experimentation on how to solve that pain point for consumers of being annoyed about how many different subscriptions they're having to sort of keep track of mm -hmm. and, and subscribe to. So I'm assuming uh, the folks listening to this, unfortunately, very few of them have a cable package or if they do, it's because, you know, mom and dad are breaking them off the password. Um, but, uh, there, so to the extent that there's interest in going into this world, it's probably more in that digital, uh, side of things. So can you talk a little bit about like who does what at a streaming service? Like you could use Hulu as an example or prime or whatever, like how are those companies structured? What kind of people feed into what roles? 
Yeah. Um, so there are generally a few sort of big departments worth of people and then how they all get structured and sort of matrix together really varies by company. But um, I can speak to content, which I know uh, the best. There's typically one or several content teams. Uh, when I say several, it's because there may be a team focused on original content and a different team focused on licensing content. Uh, so when I and Hulu might have been buying a and &E international content from you, that would have been from the acquired content side of the house. Uh, and then we might commission an original series like Handmaid's Tale that might sit in sort of a different team. Uh, right, so, so Hulu will have like Handmaid's Tale, they bought the script, they paid for the production of it, they approved everything like they were just originally making it. And the licensing part is where you get kind of reruns uh, of other people's stuff on the platform. So that's kind exactly. of the two creative divisions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And one tends to be on balance more creative, which is the originals, and the other tends to be on balance more analytical and kind of business side oriented, and that's acquisitions uh, in terms of kind of career path. Um, lots more MBAs on the acquisition side, lots more kind of former development execs and assistants and uh, sort of people who came up through agency trainee programs on the original side. So what, so what does that mean? So like on the acquisition side, you are doing, what's the kind of data research somebody who is an acquisitions executive at a Hulu or a Prime or a, a Netflix might do? Yeah, so generally when you're acquiring content, and this is certainly not the case every time, but generally there's more data available to help guide the decision about should we license this content and how much should we pay for it? It's been out there in the world. So you can look at Google search traffic. You can look at Nielsen ratings if it was on uh, cable television. You can look at, um, you know, if you're at Amazon or Apple, you can look at EST purchases of that show. Um, there are lots of sort of external signals to say, how popular is this show or movie? What's the kind of demonstrated audience demand that can help size? Okay, well, I should pay X for it. Um, in original programming, uh, you sort of only can look at like content. So we've done shows like this, how did they do? Or this director's last show performed like this, but there's a much bigger kind of variance between past performance and future performance on something that doesn't exist yet than when you're evaluating that exact Thing. I know so that you the may look at that... piracy is actually a big input um, sometimes on, on content acquisition where you say, okay, well, if a lot of people are going out of their way to illegally download this show, then chances are that's a degree of passion and fandom about that show that demonstrates there's real interest. Maybe those people, if they could watch it, you know, legally on a streaming service, some of them would go watch it there. I just want to note for the folks in the room that uh, we were, we're going to set aside a few minutes at the end for questions. So gather whatever thoughts and questions that you have, uh, you know, be able to ask Lisa directly. Um, yeah, I was going to say like the, the myth behind House of Cards, which was kind of like the first big series that anybody really paid attention to um, on a streaming platform was that somebody typed in like, you know, Kevin Spacey and they say, oh, he does really well. And you know, politics does really well. And if we add Kevin Spacey plus politics plus da, 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 we're going to have a hit. And what do you know? The algorithm leads to this hit. It's hard for me to believe that that's really what happens. Um, but, you know, put the lie to that or confirm it or, you know, how does that work? Yeah, um, I think all of those analyses can be done and can be used to inform that decision. Um, but you can wind up with a house of cards, which is wildly successful, or I'll pick on Marco Polo, which was a wildly expensive Netflix drama that I think was a complete fail. Um, I have no actual data, just sort of reputed to be. Um, and so, you know, you can have all the access to data you want. You can't engineer your way to a hit, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess but that's... you're asking about uh, the sort of departments and structures right, yeah. uh, within streaming. So content is obviously a big one. Um, engineering and product, generally gigantic headcount, lots of com uh, computer science you know, folks, lots of um, kind of software development engineers. Um, What's the product... difference? What's the difference between engineering and product? Or are they the same thing? So sometimes they are in a single org, but usually it is a different discipline. So generally engineering would be the folks actually writing the code uh, that goes into the various features and functionality and the product team is more the design and conception of it. Um, so the product team often kind of sits in between say business folks like content, marketing, uh, finance, et cetera, and engineering to sort of design the features and do some translation. Um, 
an analogy that was probably wildly offensive to uh, to engineers and w super understates, I think, their uh, their value. But if you think about the product uh, management team as sort of the architects, they draw up the plans, but then you know they sort of hand it off to another team to go build the building. That doesn't sound so insulting. I mean, <laughs> being called an architect would be an upgrade for me. So I would yeah, no, that. it's the more the like construction worker uh, analogy oh, the other side for engineering <laughs> that I think probably under, you know sort of understates. Um, now, but you it have maybe so, as a sort of helpful analogy. So many of these companies these days have, you know, they have a digital platform which could be an SVOD platform, meaning a subscription video on demand, like a, you know, like a Amazon Prime, for example, you have to pay $10 a year or whatever, whatever it's up to now, um, or a month. Uh, or, and then you have, uh, again, look, taking Amazon as an example, they have IMDB, IMD, IMDB, IMDB TV, TV. Um, which is a advertising supported platform. You look at the same with Discovery, they're all the linear, um, you know, kind of analog uh, networks. And then you have the Discovery Plus, you have Disney who has Disney Channel and ABC, but then Disney Plus. How does the traffic direction happen on what show gets commissioned for which one of those platforms? Yeah, um, so uh, let's see, short answer is not everybody commissions original content. So I think IMDB TV, Pluto, um, to probably 99.99% of the volume on a YouTube is sort of not commissioned original content. In the case of Pluto, IMDb TV, it's majority licensed kind of second run content. Um, so not the, the ad supported, free ad supported model tend, the economics tend to support licensed content um, or UGC much in a much more kind of viable way than original content commissioning. Um, if you think about it on a per episode basis, it could be you know fifty to a hundred times more expensive to greenlight a show versus to license a show. Um, so having a dual revenue stream, subscription plus advertising, um, can can certainly help that. Cable networks and broadcast networks have had that dual revenue stream. They get the uh, per subscriber fees from a cable subscriber plus advertiser uh, fees that run against it. Um, I think everybody is kind of in the first inning of trying to really figure out exactly what content is right for what platform and what window and what audience. Um, I think a very, very kind of simplistic rule of thumb is usually the digital audiences skew younger than the traditional cable audiences. So I think median viewer on a lot of cable networks is you know 55 or higher. Uh, whereas median subscribers of streaming services, I think has generally been about 20 years younger than that. Um, so some of it is about well, what is the age of the person on the other end of the screen that you're trying to reach and really program towards. Um, some of it is about the behavior pattern of viewers on streaming services. So um, your expectations when you open up a Netflix app or a YouTube app or a uh, turn on your cable television, your expectations about your experience, the kind of content you expect to be there, what you would go searching for are quite different. I think we've seen lots of examples of um, sort of, you know, YouTube trying to produce more kind of premium feeling content and that not really being what people expect to find there. Cobra Kai starts on YouTube, goes to Netflix, sort of blows up because that's the content that I think people are more expecting to see on Netflix. Um, and so I think people are, you know, trying to figure out, is it, how do I program to the audience that is going to be using that service in the way that they're kind of expecting to be engaged with? So for example, on streaming services, I think you've historically seen original content lead much more heavily into serialized storytelling because it's, that platform is very well suited to, I sit down watch episode one and then two and then three in order, often in very short order. Um, and so a serialized story is very, very satisfying. Whereas, you know, on linear, historically, a lot of the most popular shows, Seinfeld, Friends, you know, the list goes on, South Park, every episode is self-contained. That, that behavior is very easy on linear because you can just drop in and watch any episode. You don't have to kind of schedule your life around it. So I think those are some of the differences, but you're starting to see others like, if it's an ad supported program versus not ad supported, you may say not ad supported, go a little more risque. Uh, you know, the sort of nudity or violence you may see on an HBO versus uh, an ad supported cable network. So 
some of the I think differences around the margin from but that but like perspective talking close to home if you can do it like I see like 90 day fiance which is like a big franchise for TLC it's it's I think it's the show that's responsible for uh, TLC being number one in women like TLC is now number one with women which is a massive achievement but if you're sitting there which you do and say like okay we have another great season should we put it on Discovery Plus or should we put it on TLC or but let's not personalize it let's use another let's use um, uh, like FX on Hulu like right which is a little bit different because was fx on hulu something that existed when you were at hulu mm -hmm. yeah so why don't, why don't you talk a little bit about like so fx on hulu exists because there was a relationship between like fox was a part owner of hulu right and fx is owned by fox and so that's kind of how that co-branding came together yeah so when would something go on fx versus go on hulu yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of considerations that are taken into account for those kinds of decisions. I think in the uh, in the early days, scheduling was um, was a pretty big factor of okay, we have you know ten shows and eight slots on the network, so great, those two <laughs> go over to Hulu where there's infinite shelf space. Um, so I think that's one factor that probably weighed pretty heavily kind of early on. Um, I would anticipate that since having, you know, gotten a number of those shows up and running, they would be doing the same things we're doing at Discovery Plus, which is to say, okay, which ones seem to be over-indexing on, on the streaming platform, which ones seem to be performing better on the linear platform, and start to tailor the content, again, to that audience, where, um, so I'll, I'll give a 90-day example, which is that, um, 90 Day, uh, the sort of mothership franchise, 90 Day, which is now in its eighth season, is airing every Sunday night on TLC. We created a companion show called 90 Day Bears All, which is sort of a tell-all after show, dish the scoop show, which is exclusive to Discovery+. Plus. The best experience is had by watching both of them. And if you watch the episode that airs Sunday nights on TLC, there's a lot of juicy, interesting bits that are sort of alluded to but you have to go over to Discovery Plus to watch Bears All to really get the the sort of real dirt. And, do, and there's some do, stuff do, in Bears do, All do, that we couldn't have aired um, from a kind of viewers, S perspective. Do viewers ever get pissed off that you're like making them go to the pay platform to find the juicy bits? Or, I mean, or nobody could it likes theoretically to be asked to be, happen. Yeah, no, I mean, nobody likes to be asked to pay extra for something. Um, but what you hope you're doing as a programmer is giving them something that is of sufficient value that even if there may be a little bit of sort of moaning and groaning, because everybody would rather get everything for free, then eventually you're delivering enough value to them that they feel good about it. Mm. So we've been hinting at what you're doing at um, Discovery. Can you describe your role a little bit more fully? Yeah. Um, so it's uh, sort of two different sides of, of a coin. Uh, on the content side, it's really thinking about what is the content that we need on Discovery Plus? How do we use the content that we already own? How do we think about that kind of windowing relationship between what we're airing on the networks, what we're airing on Discovery Plus? Should something start on the networks and go on a delay? Should something start on Discovery Plus and go to the networks? Uh, do we need third-party content? So we've licensed content from BBC and A&E and Warner Media and others. Uh, so do we need third-party content? If so, going out and getting it. Um, and then really trying to think about how to kind of maximize the, the utilization of that content. So how do we get it in front of the right people at the right time? So there's a whole sort of content bucket uh, of responsibilities. And then the commercial strategy side is really more about um, sort of business development, distribution partnerships. So if content is about sort of getting content into the platform, the commercial strategy side is about getting the platform into people's hands. And so working with, um, companies like say Verizon uh, to really optimize that partnership and say, okay, how can we equip you Verizon to uh, get lots of people to subscribe to Discovery Plus through your deal, through you know special content plays, kind of optimizing the marketing funnel and sign up flows, um, conversations with companies in say retail or you know financial institutions, or uh, you could imagine um, with sort of the Discovery uh, lineup of genres, you could imagine something like um, buy a cooking class, uh, get 
you know, all of the content from Food Network as part of your Discovery Plus subscription, there could be some kind of interesting bundles there. So the commercial strategy side is about interesting partnerships with companies that aren't Discovery uh, to try to help get uh, get Discovery Plus kind of broader awareness and also drive uh, subscribers. Hmm. That sounds like a lot. You must have a massive team to help you. I'm sure that you get lots of sleep and uh, all the hard work. If only. Uh, I have I have discovery to thank for these extra deep eye bags. <laughs> I've been there. I feel you. Now, er, almost every one of these platforms is international, right? Um, you know, it's it's rare to find a geographically limited platform. If you're putting the money and the muscle into developing and marketing something, you know, it goes around the world. And as you know, Discovery was one of the earliest companies in recognizing the wisdom of having international linear channels. And they have many of them and they have a very big international business. When you commission or acquire new programming for Discovery Plus, do you think about it with, you know, Spain or Africa or, you know, Singapore in mind? Or is it just like, hey, it's got to work for the US. If it works for the US, then it'll work everywhere else. Yeah, um, I think the answer to that question is more of an evolution um, where Discovery Plus is up and running in Nordics, UK, Italy, Spain, India. There's sort of a handful of markets that are already up and running and then more coming over the course of this year and next. Um, and so at the beginning, the U.S. is sort of our home turf. We have to nail it here. If we don't nail it here, then you know it really kind of reduces our flexibility for the international expansion. And so first priority is absolutely what is the content that is going to nail it in the U.S. for U.S. subscribers. But as we kind of evolve over the course of this year, and also as Discovery Plus begins to roll out more broadly, we're definitely looking at those signals of what do we think has potential international appeal kind of in the event of a tie, we'll go for the show that will travel better. And so you see certain genres of content like true crime, paranormal, dating and relationships tend to travel really well. Uh, people will watch the same show in every country or formats of that show in every country um, where you see other kinds of content um, like food, which is kind of by definition quite local because you want to know about the food that is your culture to eat. Part of, you know, part of what makes food so special is how regionalized it is. Um, and so exporting kind of American food programming, you know, is a little bit less compelling um, versus but, say making a new food coming? show in that country. I was going to say, like, will there come a time in your gestation where you are making something for Italy in Italy and maybe somebody else will like it? Sort of like you've seen, you know, a lot, you know, uh, Money Heist, Casa de Papel, uh, which is made in Spain for Netflix and they export it around the world. Is that yeah, on the list? Yeah, so we have our first few um, imports launching mm -hmm. on, uh, on Discovery Plus next month. We just announced yesterday. So Lady Gucci, which is an Italian true crime series. Um, is launching on, I think, March 20th. Um, and it is, you know, the story of sort of Gucci killing, and it is in, in Italian, um, and we'll air it with subtitles um, and see how it does. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we are experimenting with some of that kind of cross-border content sharing, um, and we'll hopefully find some, find some success stories. So that's very much in the digital vein of like the guessing and testing or the A-B testing or, you know, fail fast, move on. So you're sort of, you're still in that, that period. Oh, I expect we'll be in that period forever. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> the consumer is always evolving. Your subscriber base is always evolving. The other options available to a consumer in the market, what they're comparing you to is always evolving. Um, so no, I expect us to be in that test and learn forever. Mm. So Netflix, Netflix is Netflix. It's one thing. I understand it. I know how to subscribe to it. I have, I've been watching HBO my whole life. Uh, and then I got HBO Go. And then I saw HBO Now. And I kind of figured out what that was. And then I got HBO Max. And I can't tell you that I know the difference between HBO Max, HBO Go, HBO Now. Then you have NBC, who has Peacock. And you have, you know, Viacom, which has Paramount Plus. What, there's this logo soup floating around. And obviously branding, especially in a very competitive world, is such a key important, important part to the success of any one of these new ventures. How does a multi, uh, you know, octopus armed company like Discovery or like the other ones I mentioned, manage that brand messaging? 
Yeah, um, it is super hard um, is the short answer. So you gave the Netflix example as a best in class example, but some people would remember back in, I think it was 2013, they tried to split and call half of it Flickster and half of it Netflix and it caused great mayhem and their stocks sort of cratered and they backed off and said, wait, never mind. Um, I think there is, and you know, Hulu was Hulu and then Hulu and Hulu Plus, and then everybody found that confusing and ultimately the plus went away and it was just Hulu and you could subscribe to different tiers. So it's in some ways, you have a different set of challenges if you're starting from absolute scratch, like a Netflix or a Hulu or a Quibi, and you get to build the perception of, from the consumer of uh, what is this product and you're starting from scratch so you don't have any sort of legacy. I have to distinguish HBO Max from HBO Go and Now, um, and then I have to teach people you know, what's inside the plus, if it's Apple Plus or Disney Plus or Discovery Plus. Um, so you, either way, you've got a challenge. You either have to build a brand from scratch and teach people what it is, but without any baggage, or you've got a brand that has some awareness that people have heard of, that are, you know, have, have some sort of value you know, attribution to it. But now you have to teach people, it's actually not exactly the brand that you know, it's something slightly different. Um, and so I think HBO Max has, has you know, certainly been challenged by that. You know, we within Discovery are constantly trying to think about how do we teach people that inside the plus is TLC and Food Network and ID and HG and all this original content um, because people immediately think, oh yeah, it's probably a streaming service of Discovery Channel. And we have the challenge of, oh, it's actually so much more. Um, so I think it's, you know, you kind of have to pick your poison, um, because none of it is easy and building a, a new brand that really has value to the consumer is, can be hard and expensive and time consuming. So yeah, it's a, it's a real, real challenge. And so many of these media companies didn't have kind of consumer facing brands that really melt, meant something. You mentioned, uh, CBS all access converting into Paramount plus of the Viacom brands. Some of their cable network brands, MTV, Comedy Central, VH1 kind of mean something, but they mean something quite focused and quite specific to a targeted audience. Viacom means nothing to any consumer. That's never been a consumer facing brand. And so they kind of had to, you know, look at the portfolio and like, okay, well, what do we think is our best shot to, con you know, communicate something to the consumer? This is of value, um, but knowing that they're still going to have to imbue a whole lot of other kind of characteristics into it. Mm. Uh, Edith, Layla, April, I'm not sure if this is possible, but I'd love people to just type the word me in the chat box if they knew that Discovery and TLC were part of the same company or if that's a, uh, if that's a new, or if they've never even heard of Discovery and TLC. But let's assuming you had, did you know that Discovery and TLC were part of the same uh, company? Uh, now, Speaking of branding, like a, there's another interesting um, element, which is you have all these discovery owned brands, right? The ones that we've mentioned, but you also went out and bought programming from A and E, which probably many people might even think is part of the discovery family. I, I remember like doing research with um, viewer groups. They didn't really know the difference between history channel and discovery and all that stuff. Does that pose a branding problem? Why does it make sense to have A&D programming on a discovery branded um, uh, platform? Honestly, it's because of that confusion, if you ask me. I think there are plenty of shows. We were doing focus groups, kind of testing a variety of different you know, value propositions and descriptions of the product and logos and all kinds of things. And there were, there were people who in the focus group said, oh yeah, discovery, I love orders. I love intervention um, and kind of naming shows that, weren't ours, but that they think were. And so part of the theory behind uh, doing a deal with the A&E networks was let no consumer be disappointed. So when they show up thinking, I'm gonna find a lot of great unscripted programming on this service, maybe that I associate with a Discovery Channel or um, you know, with the TLC or, or one of the brands that I know, um, most consumers don't have that tight an association between show brand and network brand, and none of them really have network brand to parent company conglomerate brand. Um, mm. And so it's just try to make sure you're going to have the content that people expect you to have um, so that they're not disappointed when they show up. Mm. Hey, so why don't we open it up for some questions now in case uh, there are any out there. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, anyone, you can either turn your camera on or put it in the chat box, I suppose. 
um, while, while people get the courage up, just tell us quickly about what's happening with COVID as it affects production of new content. Oh yeah, no, that has been a sticky wicket for the whole industry. I mean, we're all trying to figure out how to keep everybody safe as the number one priority but also keep people employed um, and, and shooting programming. I think Discovery's had a, a real advantage that all we do is unscripted. And so mm -hmm. that has been easier from a kind of footprint perspective um, to, to manage in a kind of COVID safe way. There are plenty of shows shoot in Alaska with outdoors and kind of everyone's already far apart from each other during the shoot. Uh, that can make it easier. Uh, we've done particularly with uh, food and with the 90 day franchise shipped filming equipment to the talent who are now shooting themselves at home. So Amy Schumer shot a cooking show in her home living room with a nanny cam <laughs> and as a remote controlled camera, uh, we shot an entire show called 90 day diaries, which is all the cast members at home living through COVID kind of shooting themselves. Um, so we've had, we've tried to apply a lot of creativity to how can you keep making interesting content in a way where everybody is safe. Um, and that is still really, interesting and compelling to the consumer because I think none of us, so many of us are staring at, you know, screens that look like this all day, the sort of grid of faces uh, for unwinding at the end of the day. We don't necessarily want to watch more that looks exactly like that. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a real challenge. Um, but I think folks have, you know, everybody's sort of got protocols in place in terms of isolation, quarantine, you know, frequent testing. Um, so we've been, we've been lucky that, um, you know, folks mm. have been um, stand safe. Now there, there is a, uh, there is a short form company that is owned in part by, or maybe entirely by discovery. There's a company called group nine, right? That's a mm -hmm. short form company. Uh, who, what is the ownership there? And do you run any, is a short form part of your strategy on discovery plus? Yeah. So group nine is part of the sort of larger corporate family of, uh, of discovery. And they uh, also, lots of people probably haven't heard of Group Nine, but may have heard of Pop Sugar or The Dodo uh, or Thrillist, um, now This News. So they do have some very kind of consumer forward uh, digital brands. Uh, they're really, I think, best known as uh, social brands. So they have tons and tons mm -hmm. of followers on you know, Instagram and other social platforms. Um, so we're doing a few things uh, with them. We've got uh, a licensing deal where a lot of their existing content that they've produced for platforms like Facebook and YouTube and others is available for streaming on uh, on Discovery Plus. I'll put in a little plug for uh, some Pop Sugar Fitness classes if you're feeling that new year, new you uh, kind of uh, vibe. Um, we're also uh, commissioning some original content with them because the brand overlap uh, really kind of makes sense if you think like the Dodo Animal Planet, both about animals and pets. Um, and then uh, they've also been a great marketing partner around the launch of Discovery Plus. So um, finding interesting ways of uh, telling audiences that you know we think have affinity for both brands, hey, you like this, you might also like that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what do you believe in uh, that short form kind of as a platform driver? Like, let's talk about what happened with Quibi and were you one of those who thought yeah, it's never going to work, or were you surprised with what happened? Um, I unfortunately was not at all surprised. I think I was predicting gloom and doom for Quibi more or less from the time it was announced. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the track record of before Quibi, there was Vessel. Before Vessel, frankly, there's been three or four different iterations of a YouTube premium product. I think consumer expectation around short form content is that it's free. Um, and even if it's not that it's free, there is so much of it that is freely available. Um, how much better is this than what I have available for free? Um, I think particularly the sort of business model um, where the, the concept of it is, it is high-end premium content chopped up into little pieces. Like, well, if you only have five minutes, you could start watching a regular TV show and just pause it if you, you know, run out of time. So the idea that you sort of need to chunk content into little bite-sized pieces I don't know. I mean, for me, when I'm standing in line at a Starbucks, I might be checking my email, which is a sort of accordion based activity. If the standing in line is going to take 30 seconds or 10 minutes, I can fill that time kind of flexibly. I don't usually know when I'm starting something like that. Oh, well, this, it, this line looks like a three minute and 30 second line. Okay. So I'm going to find a three minute and 30 second piece of content to watch. I think that's just not 
unfortunately consumer behavior. So um, yeah, it seems like there's there's no real there's no limit of things to do to occupy yourself. You know, when you're waiting for coffee or waiting in line to pick up your kid from school or whatever, there's like you know, yeah, it's either work or you know, every Twitter social media constant. platform on the platform yeah. on the planet that also kind of has that accordion um, in terms of right. how how to spend time. So yeah, I don't think it was serving an unmet demand, unfortunately. And so, what makes you feel like you might have a different result um, if you on a you know on a kind of a platform that's you know Roku based or television set based? I mean, I think what what I saw at Hulu and what we're seeing at Discovery and kind of you anecdotally hear about everything is that for these subscription video on demand products, the sort of streaming services, seventy five plus percent of time spent is spent in the living room on the big screen TV set, mm -hmm. be it a smart TV or a you know uh, casting device or a console, anything in between. Um, that is still where people spend, where most people spend most time watching video is the big screen. Um, so really, really critical to be there. Uh, Discovery Plus was proud to launch on both Roku and uh, Amazon devices, uh, which I know was sort of a, a sticky point for some of the services that launched last year. Um, you want to be was where- it, By the way, like what was, what was the issue between HBO and Roku and HBO and um, Amazon. Like, what was the? Why didn't they launch immediately on those platforms? Um, well, so I think there were there are a couple of um, areas where the business interests don't totally overlap. So, um, Roku and Amazon are uh, both ad supported products, and so they both want access to a certain amount of ad inventory in sort of any app that is on their platform. Um, to help them grow their ad business. And so um, versus if you're a programmer, you wanna control all of your own ad inventory, that's part of how you make the revenue. And so one big area of kind of dispute is who gets ownership over that ad inventory. Um, and as relates to that, the sort of consumer data that helps you be, be really smart about targeting that ad inventory. Um, the other piece that um, I think was, was true in some cases, HBO had, participated in that kind of super bundle that I described earlier uh, with Roku and Amazon, where all of their content had been ingested as HBO. You could subscribe to HBO kind of one click through Roku or Amazon. Great. Well, unfortunately for HBO, that meant they didn't necessarily get perfect data about that consumer behavior, what they were watching. They may not be able to contact that consumer to say, hey, your credit card expired. Can you enter in a new you know, payment mechanism? Or, hey, there's a new show coming up that we think you're gonna be interested in. And part of what every you know, programmer who's going direct to consumer is starting to feel more strongly about is they actually want that direct relationship with the consumer and HBO was kind of disintermediated by, by Roku and Amazon. So and who so, won? Did they, did, did they settle because HBO got what they wanted or because Roku got what it wanted? Well, presumably we enough of both um, <laughs> because they're now live on the platform. Um, right. But there is a bit of a wonky consumer experience where you can watch HBO content inside of your Amazon Prime video service. But if you want content that's on HBO Max and not HBO, you have to download the HBO Max at, app and go over there to watch it. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a tricky kind of transition as all of these companies evolve their business models. And, you know, the consumers are a little bit getting sort of caught in between. Um, but you know, it, it will eventually work out. It just might take a few kind of cycles of renegotiation. Great. Uh, all right. Well, before we wrap up, I'll give one more shot for, uh, if anybody has a question. Um, all right. I guess we answered everybody's question. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for your time and your candor. Uh, it was a pleasure. I look forward to having this conversation with you during the course in the, over the summer as well. Very good. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.